Ytringsfrihetsforum det er et samarbeidsprosjekt mellom Tenketanken Agenda og Civita sammen med organisasjonene Humanetisk Forbund og ELIM. Sentrum Venstre og Sentrum Høyre kan være uenige om veldig mye, men vi er veldig enige om at ytringsfriheten er en grunnleggende verdi i et demokratisk samfunn, og vi ønsker en arena for debatt om ytringsfrihetens kår og trusler mot frie ytringer i vår tid. Det vil komme flere slike møter som dette. Det vil også komme en del kveldsmøter, der vi håper å komme sammen fysisk og ha gode diskusjoner. Men disse møtene vil også bli strømmet, så de vil bli publisert både som strømming og som podcast, slik at de kan nå ut til også de som ikke har anledning til å komme på møtene våre i Oslo. Det finnes også en egen Facebook-gruppe, med samme navn, altså Ytringsfrihetsforum, og jeg vil herved oppmuntre dere alle til å følge med på hva som skjer der fremover og delta der. Ytringsfrihetsdebatten i Norge kan kanskje ha tendens til å bli litt selvsentrert. Det står egentlig relativt bra til med ytringsfriheten i Norge, selv om det er utfordringer også hos oss. Men løfter vi blikket litt grann, så blir bildet et annet, og internasjonalt sett er ytringsfriheten under meget sterkt press. Angrepene på pressfriheten og forsamlingsfriheten i Hongkong er et eksempel på dette. Regimet i Beijing har slått hardt ned på demokratibevegelsen i Hongkong i form av sensur og brutal vold. Vi må solidarisere oss med de som risikerer mye for å ta ytringsfriheten i forsvar. Og en av disse er dagens gjest, Gleisje Pong, er politisk aktivist fra Hongkong og research fellow ved Hongkong Democracy Council i Washington DC. Hun var allerede invitert til Oslo Freedom Forum, og vi er veldig heldige som da også kunne få henne hit. Vi har bedt henne å orientere oss om hva som har skjedd med demokratibevegelsen i Hongkong, og hva slags støtte de trenger nå. Deretter vil Guri Melby kommentere innlegget. Guri Melby er kunnskaps- og integreringsminister og leder i Venstre. Vi trenger diskusjoner om hvordan vi skal møte Kinas globale forsøk på å undertrykke ytringsfriheten. For dette angår ikke bare demokratibevegelsen i Hongkong, men det angår oss alle. And now we switch to English and the situation in Hong Kong. I'm happy to introduce Eirik Løkke from the think tank Civita, who will guide us through the rest of this meeting. Eirik, the floor is yours. Thank you for that uh, introduction, Hilda, and for the benefit of our foreign guests. We, of course, will do this in, in English. And in just a few moments, I'll give the floor to you, Glacier. But let me just use 60 seconds to provide you with some practical details. Glacier will have 10 minutes to share her opening, followed by Guri's initial thoughts. Uh, thereafter, I will lead the conversation with Glacier and Guri. If you want to comment or ask questions online, and I hope you do, you can submit comments just below the stream here, or use Twitter with the hashtag Uttingsfredsforum. And I will be happy to follow up with your questions if they are pertinent. We will end no later than one o'clock. Well, that's all the practicalities. Now I'm very interested to hear about the situation in Hong Kong. So Glacier, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. First of all, I'd like to thank everyone who is on the live stream with us, and thank you for having me here to talk about what's happening in Hong Kong, because the situation does require a lot of attention from the global community. Since the adoption of the national security law last year in 2020 in July, our freedoms and fundamental rights are greatly eroded. Journalists, professionals doing their job are now considered as criminals or committing crimes. Like there are documentaries makers being prosecuted under Hong Kong's law for revealing truths about what happened in 2019 during the movement took place. Documentaries are being pulled from the internet and deleted so that there will be no trace left for certain issues. And it's very, it would be increasingly difficult to hold the government accountable with journalistic materials and so on. And just through the course of this year, 49 civil society groups have disbanded themselves or being forced to disband. Traditional groups like the Hong Kong Alliance for Patriotic Actions in Hong Kong, who usually annually hold 
the June 4th massacre virtues are now being forced to disband. And they are being requested to hand over all related data and materials as they are being accused as a foreign agent. And now under this national security law, the government and the authorities enjoy impunity while any acts calling for democracy in Hong Kong would be considered as endangering national security. Recently, the government are talking about how do they implement patriotic education into our education system so that youngsters will be brought up in the education of understanding the Chinese Communist Party as an open, progressive party that is leading China and Hong Kong towards a better place. And all of the materials listed in this new curriculum, there are clearly mistakes about historical facts. For example, the June 4th massacre never happened or that in other occasions that relate to the relationships between Hong Kong and China, that China has been described as doing, uh, that had been, did more than it actually did. And under this national security law and the constant crackdown of the government, there is a high sense of self-censorship and fear in the society. It is understandable that all of us are afraid even myself being abroad as an activist living in Germany, I am very cons in the constant fear of my actions or the things that I said would put people on the ground in danger. And this is actually the worst effect of the law other than simply just the actual crackdown that we see. Because the national security law and the education that I mentioned induce that fear and white terror and chilling effect into yourself that you start to think twice before you say anything. I was born before, um, right before the handover of Hong Kong. So I grew up in Hong Kong while it was still relatively free. So I enjoyed the privilege of being able to say whatever I saw fit at the time. But now it's sad to see even myself as an activist, I would engage in self-censorship, thinking through what I have to say before I say it so that I don't put people in danger. And, but there are always ways to combat it, and there are always a lot of people who are still doing the job on the ground or abroad trying to combat this self-censorship and state censorship. Because fear is very contagious in a way, but so is courage. And courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is choosing to do the right thing despite you are in fear. And this is somehow similar to what Hayful said during his time, it's like living in the truth. There are a lot of activists my dear friend Gwyneth Ho and Chao Hong Tong, one of them being an activist and the other one being a pro bono human rights lawyer, they were both standing very still in terms of not giving up their freedoms. They were defending the right to fair trial, to open fair trial in Hong Kong in the court setting despite their already being imprisoned. Gwyneth Ho recently gave out her bail application because the court refused to lift the media reporting ban. And she said, justice must not, must not only be done, it has to be seen to be done. That's why I'm withdrawing my bail application because it is not an open and fair trial. So there are always these little moments and big choices that activists and Hong Kongers are making so as to defend the rights that we should have and the freedoms we are promised. And as an activist overseas myself, I am here to urge you to pay attention not only to Hong Kong, but to all of the places that are fighting for freedoms and democracy because we're in this stage of, we witness the general deterioration of democracy all around the world. And if we do not treasure the privileges and the rights that we have here in Europe and other places of the world, then we will be trapped in a time where we will find out that these things are gone and it's been taken away from us. So I do hope like everyone who is listening to this live stream or watching, Please do not take your freedoms for granted, and please show solidarity for those who are fighting for freedom in Hong Kong and other places of the world. Thank you very much. Thank you, Glacier. Uh, Gure, the floor is yours. Thank you, and thank you, Glacier, for your report and for your appeal. Um, I visited Hong Kong two years ago now, in 2019. Uh, and when I was there, I met uh, a lot of activists. Um, and I really admired the courage that they showed. Um, and uh, many of them said almost exactly the same thing as you s are saying now. <laughs> almost like it wasn't the choice to be an activist. It was something they had to do. Um, it was impossible not to try to uh, do something. Um, and I think that's... Um, one thing to build on uh, in the fight for democracy and freedom 
uh, for the people of Hong Kong. Um, even though um, already in 2019, I think uh, I and many others thought uh, the situation seemed very difficult. Um, I hadn't really imagined it would go this fast, uh, and that we now, only two years after, um, would see a situation that is so much worse uh, in Hong Kong, uh, both because of the national security law, as you mentioned, uh, and the way that it has been used uh, to uh, silence politicians, media, activists, uh, but also, as you mentioned, the fear that this has spread in the society, both people living in Hong Kong, but also internationally. And I think for many, it has been really a wake-up call uh, uh, on what Beijing uh, is capable of doing and how, how efficient uh, Beijing can be uh, when they decide to act. Um, <clears throat> um, so um, I think uh, we need... Uh, well, there is... Uh, the worst thing we can do now is... Um, to, to give up both Hong Kong and uh, other, uh, both countries and cities and people in the same situation. Um, I think we have to see it as, as I said, a wake-up call and not, uh, nothing uh, <laughs> uh, that we can uh, sort of think that this is hopeless. Um, uh, I think uh, another um, frightening thing now is uh, the way Beijing is acting towards ha Taiwan and really stepping up, uh, being present uh, with the military, uh, and in other ways, uh, making it more and more clear that this model of one country, two systems, uh, this model isn't there anymore, and not for Hong Kong. And I think it will be very difficult for Taiwan to, to keep that model uh, in the future as well. Uh, but the question is, what can we do? <laughs> what can we do as a country what can we do as citizens uh, in order to uh, stop uh, Beijing uh, and silencing uh, more and more people around the world? Well, I think uh, the least Norway can do is, of course, to um, uh, cooperate with activists and others, um, others who need maybe a safe harbor, uh, a place to go in uh, Norway, together with other uh, European countries, mainly. Uh, I think it's important that we, uh, even though it's difficult to see that we can turn around the situation in Hong Kong in a short term, uh, it's, uh, it's of course possible to do it in a longer term. Um, and I think the strength of the Hong Kong society is that what we saw in 2018, 2019 was the demonstrations uh, were very massive a lot of people involved in it. So this is not, not something that just um, a few, uh, a small elite or something was involved in. This was something that uh, almost the whole population was involved in. And I think that is something uh, that gives hope for the future, even though it seems a bit hopeless right now. Um, <clears throat> but I think as a... Uh, yeah, internationally, uh, Norway is, of course, a small country. And I think the best way for us uh, to make a change uh, towards China is together with other countries, um, first and foremost, EU. Um, uh, the uh, Sanctions Act that we implemented uh, this spring in Norway uh, was one important step. Uh, and... Uh, one way that the international community can work together um, to be very clear on uh, what we see as uh, uh, crossing a line or not. Uh, I think also, um, uh, I think uh, we have to work on um, uh, what we're going to do about Taiwan uh, to try our best to make sure it doesn't uh, happen the same there as it has happened in Hong Kong. Uh, the last couple, couple of years. Um, our hope has to be that Taiwan uh, could be uh, the model for <laughs> the mainland and not vice versa. Um, and um, uh, we have to do what we can to, to keep Taiwan relatively free uh, as it is uh, today. 
what is interesting is that, um, as with uh, many other uh, authoritarian regimes, uh, the way China acts is a clear <laughs> uh, evidence of uh, lack of confidence because they see a threat in every angle uh, and they have to strike down en any sign of opposition uh, because um, they fear what that can do uh, to the country and its power. That is a weakness that maybe the rest of the world can use. Um, and I think uh, that is something that we uh, should discuss more, how we can use that weakness. Uh, it's important that we are clear when uh, China uh, clearly um, does things that we will not um, tolerate, like uh, the hacker attack uh, in the Norwegian parliament. Uh, I think that also shows us that at this time, um, China is not a partner that we can rely on. And I think that also makes it very difficult uh, for Norway uh, to, uh, to go into any agreements about trade, for instance, with China, when the situation is what it is right now. Thank you. Thank you, Guri. And uh, uh, as mentioned in my introduction, feel free to ask questions, comments on online, and I'll follow up if they're pertinent. Uh, pleasure. In your, in your view, how has the Western response, to be a bit broad, been towards China in, in the context of Hong Kong? Uh, is it adequate? For like speaking from a perspective of a Hong Kong activist, of course it's not adequate or else I wouldn't be sitting here <laughs> talking to all of you. So what do you miss? Um, I, I'd say there is a general shift of um, attitude from 2019 to 2020, especially after COVID broke out. Like, countries start to realize something is wrong with the dependency on China in terms of production chains and econ economy. And on the other hand, they realize how China was never a compliant player when it comes to international laws and standards, like how they reacted to the WHO's request of investigation of COVID in Wuhan. How did they react to Taiwan trying to help, but, he, but China is like, no, Taiwan is not a country. They cannot sit in the WHO and so on. So countries have came to realize oh no, this is not the player that we expected China to be. But I'd say the reactions that the West has given, especially when it comes to Hong Kong, is not enough. Of course, there are attempts. For example, the UK, Canada, Australia have offered the Safe Harbor program for Hong Kong or so that we have a safe place to be and we can work and we can sustain ourselves abroad. And at, like that's a start. But when it comes to the EU, I think that European Union is pretty limited when it comes to reacting to the threats of China towards human rights, especially when EU pledged itself to never be directly, indirectly involved in human rights violations in its founding treaties. The sanction um, in the earlier of this year is actually a really good start that they make it very explicit that these people are involved in human rights violation, therefore we are applying individual sanctions on them. But at the same time, like Germany and France are still trying very eagerly to push for the CAI, the Comprehensive Agreement on Investment in China. It is quite worrying that have they actually noticed in COVID or in other times that European Union is all really dependent on China and being too afraid to speak up because even if it's trade or investment is not having a one way, it's not a one way thing. It's required both parties to be there, to be present in the trade and in the investments and so on. So it's not like only the European firms needed the Chinese market. Chinese market also needs the services and the goods provided by the European Union. So it would, it, the CAI or trade in general shouldn't be used as a tool for for as a leverage for the China to require the EU to shut up about human rights. And I think more and more countries in the European Union have came to understand the threat of China, but it is not very um, likely that there will be stronger actions because of the structure of the European Union, its decision-making mechanism in general that is in the way of, for example, when it comes to foreign affairs, or they have to reach a consensus in the European Council. Uh, but it's quite impossible when there are only one country that says no, and mm -hmm. It's increasingly happening, like when it comes to like, issuing statements and so on. We have seen it in the past. Um, so I, I think the, it would be great if the European Union can offer a safe harbor program for Hong Kongers, especially there are a lot of Hong Kongers who are already studying or living their lives in Europe. And 
having a safe harbor program would save them from entering the track of asylum because not everyone is qualified with that high legal threshold of asylum seeking as a Hong Konger. But then they will face the problem of if I stayed in Europe and I cannot go back to Hong Kong, then that's going to be some implications there. That's going to be very complicated to solve without a safe harbor program. And there are other things that they can do, like stop pushing for the CAI, the investment deal, and really speak up against human rights violations. For example, the Winter Olympics in Beijing is coming up in February next year. And is European Union in general going to just remain silent about all the human rights violation, but still send athletes in. I think there is a lot of things that we can campaign for in order to raise more awareness at least. Mm. Uh, actually, Oslo was very early one of the favorites to host the Olympics in 2022, but uh, it went to Beijing. And Guri, should we boycott the Beijing Olympics? Well, actually, one of the reasons why I fought for Oslo being a host of the Olympics was that um, to avoid uh, the Olympics only being hosted by regimes that we may be uh, critical towards. Uh, and I think that Western countries like uh, Norway should actually take responsibility and be a host of events like this. Um, uh, unfortunately, uh, the majority <laughs> in the parliament didn't agree with me, so, uh, so there we are. So now uh, the Olympics is going to be in Beijing. I think the question of boycott is um, it's a very interesting question. I'm, open to debating it, and I haven't really concluded in what the right thing to do for Norway is. Um, I think um, in this question, as in many other questions, the effect would be very small if Norway does it by itself. In, if Norway just says, we're not going to send our athletes, even though Winter Olympics is maybe the one place the world would have missed Norway. <laughs> uh, I think uh, still the effect would be very small if Norway did it by ourselves. Um, so uh, if it should have any effect, uh, there would have to be a, a bigger group of countries doing it together. Um, and we can also discuss uh, um, what is the most, most efficient thing to do. Should all the athletes um, not compete? Should should we um, uh, uh, should politicians not go there to visit, uh, as we usually do, do uh, in these sorts of events? Uh, this is a real dilemma because uh, we know that uh, other places uh, and other events, uh, it has been possible to use events like this to get meetings with the leading officials in that country to address topics like human rights. Uh, and this, they're all, uh, there will always be this question, is it better to stay at home uh, and not try to do something, or is it better to go and then have this dialogue, even though maybe we're not very optimistic in uh, what that dialogue would lead to. Uh, so I think this is a question, uh, well, um, I think, what is it, what is that? Yeah, the athletes. Yes. Uh, uh, should have a really dis discussion mm. by themselves. But I think also this is something that uh, Norway should address together with other countries. Mm. Uh, Glacier, <coughs> for many of us who, who followed the 90s, we're very optimistic about change in China. I mean, if you just had enough trade, you would show the Chinese how much better the Western system is than the Chinese system and the younger generations and so on. And that this clearly didn't happen. So, so what is your view or your analysis about the younger generation in mainland China? Are they demanding uh, any change in terms of more freedom of speech, democracy, or are they quite happy with the system the way, they, the way it works? I think it's a really difficult question for me to answer. First of all, I'm not like from mainland China, so yeah. I don't have a lot of friends that are there. And uh, secondly, there are like 14 billion people in Germany, and it's quite, uh, sorry, in, in China. And so it's quite difficult for me to overgeneralize and say, oh, this is definitely yes or no. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'd say there are definitely a percentage of younger generations in China that are quite upset about the regime. Not, maybe their, their discontent um, does not root from political system, but in general is the way of life. Like, there is a term called tangping, which is laying flat in China right now. That's quite trendy on the internet. That means they're giving up on living up to standards that the state provide, us, provide them. That is, they are not going to work 12 hours a day for six days a week 
so that they can contribute to the economic development of the country. They're not going to try to buy a flat because that's too expensive to afford. And they felt like they have been deprived of social mobility. They have been deprived of um, living a decent life, but they're being told that they are basically screws for the whole system that should only work for the benefits of the system itself, that is the regime in China. And this is actually very normal to see in China because um, under such an oppressive system, there's always going to be a reaction force that's created out of it. And this is a hint of that is happening. Of course, these terms got censored very quickly on the internet, and then official media wrote long op-eds about how these lying flat mindset is wrong, is nihilistic, it's not beneficial to the country, young people should contribute themselves to the country, and all of those very patriotical like narratives that are being like generated in counter of this lying flat like uh, discourse. Um, at the same time, actually, there have been always resistance that is happening in China. Um, for example, a few years ago, there is this 709 mass arrest of human rights lawyers in China. And there are actually small scale protests happening on a local level on, for example, a yearly basis. There's always something. Just that because there's no free flow of information in China or the news doesn't travel out of China that people will never know about. This is something that's very worrying as well because Hong Kong is now moving closer and closer to that kind of black box situation, like news cannot get in or get out because we started to have site blockings, that is, the government would block websites under a national security law, and it still remains uncertain if they will block news media, foreign mu news media, or different kinds of websites. So it's worrying that Hong Kong will fall into that black box that China does, and then there will be a question, mm, do Hong Kong youngsters really want to fight back against China anymore? And this is why the diaspora community of Hong Kongers and Hong Kong activists overseas are trying so hard to get the word out that there are still things happening, just that it's not as visible as it was before. It doesn't mean that we're giving up. And I think it's really important that we pay the attention to China in general and in Hong Kong as well, so that we know what's happening and we're trying hard to get the word out. Mm. Gure, you said in your introduction that uh, the Chinese crackdown is, a, is, a, is, a, is an expression of lack of confidence. Mm. And, and, and that, of course, is a very Western way to look at it. And, and I quite agree. The Western liberal democracy is so much better than their system and only if they only understand it. Mm -hmm. and, and I know that is a, is a big question I'm, I'm, I'm asking now, but, but still, uh, I always thought that the soft power from the West, when you have mm -hmm. Chinese people going over, they would see how much better we are than they are, but it hasn't really worked that way. Should we stop believing our, in our ability of soft power and convincing that liberal democracy is so much better, or is it, should we do something different? Well, that is a really big question. Um, well, I think uh, the one thing that we cannot do is to leave our own ideals of how the world should uh, work uh, in order to force China to do something else. Um, and well, this may sound naive, but I think the, the changes that we have seen uh, in China and in places like Hong Kong, it has happened really fast the last couple of years. Um, but... Um, that may also turn. Uh, it doesn't mean that it's going in that direction all the time. Uh, the same as we, when we in the 90s maybe thought that now the world is really getting a better place and democracy is uh, uh, flourishing and uh, bread spreading all around the world. Um, development isn't something that sort of just happens in a straight line. There, is thing, there are things we can do to, to change that. And I think if we leave our own ideals in order to influence China, I think we will lose in the long run. So, But <clears throat> the question is how can we really uh, do something that really makes uh, an impact? Um, I think that um, that's, uh, there is not like one big thing you can do to turn things around. Uh, this is something that has to go on, on long term. But I think you, I think you said something important because I think the European countries also need to have confidence uh, in how um, China actually relies on us in many things. Uh, and this is a two-way thing. Uh, and if we have confidence uh, in the dialogue with China, um, maybe that's uh, sort of the key. Uh, to uh, to get this to turn in the right way. Uh, because it's not only we who have something to lose, it's also China. 
uh, and they rely on us on a lot of things. Hmm. Um, but I, I want to say something also about, uh, as you said, um, uh, turn to Hong Kong turning into sort of a black box, because I think that's sort of maybe the most scaring uh, part of it, uh, when you say that the educational system is turning more and more patriotic. Um, one of the things that made uh, um, the biggest impression on me when I visited Hong Kong was a small museum uh, about uh, the 4th of June massacre. Um, I think maybe it was um, the smallest uh, and uh, least impressive museum I've ever seen. It uh, was in an apartment uh, uh, in one of the worst neighborhoods uh, in Hong Kong. Um, but it was a museum that told the story of what happened the 4th of June 1989. Now that museum is gone. Yes, so that was sort of the last place this story was told. Uh, and um, when fewer and fewer Hong Kongers know about their history, know about uh, China, um, uh, I think that's the really scary thing. Uh, and um, that means also that it's important for us um, to act fast uh, before uh, too many people forget about the history. Mm. Uh, a relevant follow-up here, Guri, from, from online, from Facebook, and it's a question about the Western part of the world. What direction are we moving ahead? We have some internal problems, and I'm not only talking about the situation in the United States, but it's, yeah, we, we have some challenges in, in the West, and, and how do you see this uh, challenge for democracy in the West, uh, Guri? Also a big question. <laughs> it is. Yeah. It is. Um, <clears throat> well, uh, at least here in Europe, there are many tendencies in many countries that go in the wrong direction. Um, dictators gaining power, human rights being violated, uh, many places, um, especially in the East, Eastern Europe. Uh, and that, um, well, my biggest fear is that that weakens, for instance, the EU's chance of being this uh, uh, power that can stand against uh, other powers like China. Uh, and um, one um, drawback as well is, like you said, the EU doesn't have a common foreign policy. I think few countries want that, but uh, there should be a better way of coordinating all these countries when it comes to some questions that we think are really important. Um, so, yeah, I think um, the development in the Western countries isn't very positive at the moment. Um, uh, and, um, well, that makes... Uh, the situation all the more uh, serious. Mm. Uh, Glacier, you could ask, and many people in fact are asking, is it the West is going to change China or is it China is going to change the West? What do you think? I don't have a crystal ball on my hand, so I don't have a definite answer to what the future would look like. But I'd say there, is, there are chances for any one of those scenarios happening. Uh, I think it's very important if we want the West to be able to change China into more open and more democratic and more respectful in terms of human rights country, then we will have to realize that China is not only a foreign policy problem for a lot of the countries because like climate change is a huge topic in Europe and we have seen just a few weeks ago in Germany there are like 100k people on the street demanding for policy changes in terms of climate crisis. And this is a problem that requires a global solution. And if we really care about the climate, we will have to engage with all of the countries mm -hmm. in the world, including China. Mm -hmm. But the problem comes in that China, as I said, is not a compliant player if, in terms of international standards, international treaties. They have violated the joint declaration signed with the Brits. They, after they have joined the WTO, <laughs> their market is not actually open or fair in any ways. And so it, it frustrates me a lot when I hear the debate about whether we should talk to China, as you said, like don't burn the bridges or just completely isolate China in a way because these are global problems requiring global solutions. And I don't have a clear answer, but I, am, I agree with you completely that if Europe in general is not confident about its own ideals, about upholding human rights and fundamental rights as its core value, then definitely China will be able to change Europe and the Western world with its economic power. This is what China is really good at. They're really good at 
giving you economic benefits in return of you shutting up about the so-called internal problems, which are basically human rights problems that they have. But I also see that there are ways how the Western world can change China. For example, a few weeks ago, um, during the, N I think it's the NPCC meeting in, in Beijing, Beijing wanted to implement an anti-sanction law in Hong Kong that would make it criminal for foreign firms in Hong Kong or in China if they follow um, the U.S. sanctions or European sanctions, economic sanctions, for example. Carrie Lam is being sanctioned by U the U.S., so she doesn't have access to a visa card in a way. But if, Hong if the visa um, company in Hong Kong comply with that sanction, then they are by law um, legally liable under this anti-sanction law. And as the news come out, the stock market completely dropped in a few days, and then a lot of foreign firms are discussing whether they have to leave Hong Kong mm -hmm. and retreat from the Hong Kong market. And then Beijing said, no, this is just a rumor. We're not going to implement it right away. Mm -hmm. And so you do see that the West still have leverage against China. It's not like that, as China propaganda or the narratives would say, that we are completely dependent on China. There is still leverage that we can use to solve that problem. So I, I think it really depends on how we want things to happen. And as you said, it's not like one big thing that we can mm -hmm. do. But if we can stand very firm in different little small issues, then together it will be a huge impact on China that might like facilitate meaningful changes in terms of the political system. Mm -hmm. uh, Guri, obviously Norway is a much smaller country than, than China still. Uh, I would like to ask you, uh, in your uh, engagements, to the extent you have with your counterparts in, in China and, and Norway as such, how difficult is it to address human rights issue, freedom of speech with China in the, in the current Norwegian situation? Um, well, as, um, well, the example of China hacking the parliament's email, uh, Michael Tesner's email, uh, shows that uh, it's not something that you do without risking consequences, also in Norway. Um, and of course, I fear that what you told about Hong Kong, that these examples create some kind of fear. Um, and it may not be... I think um, Michael Tetchner feels safe uh, walking around the streets of uh, Oslo, even though his email was hacked. But for others, it may actually be things like that that makes you um, think one more time about what you say, uh, also in something that feels like a very safe climate uh, to engage in this kind of uh, uh, debate. Um, so. Uh, I'm afraid that also in Norway and in other Western countries, uh, both politicians and others um, uh, are being more careful uh, about what they're saying. Um, and I think that makes it more important that uh, politicians, uh, member of parliaments, uh, actually participate in that debate, uh, stating an example, being clear that this is actually important that we do. Um, We've seen example after example from many countries now uh, that has uh, experienced sanctions from China, uh, both Sweden, Australia and others. Uh, and this shows how important it is that um, we stick together. Uh, and when one country is isolated or something else, uh, the rest of the uh, world has to stick up for them and has to show that they're not alone in uh, saying uh, something critical against China. So. Um, so I think it's uh, our responsibility, uh, everyone who has a microphone and uh, um, uh, can speak up, uh, that we actually do it. Mm. Just let me remind everybody following that it's possible to ask questions, comments on the stream below or the hashtag forum, and, and we're moving towards the end. But, uh, but can I also say something? Sure, because sure. you said that um, it can't be sort of black and white, it can't be just criticize and then isolate China from the rest of the world, because we need China uh, in order to solve uh, climate uh, issues, uh, migration issues, other issues that are global, that are big, and that, uh, of course, uh, in some aspects also, we see that China can be one of the fast movers and actually influence other countries to do something. Uh, so, so I'm uh, also a huge advocate for dialogue, uh, we just don't, um, it's important that we don't um, uh, lose our principles in that dialogue. Mm. 
uh, and uh, and uh, Glacier, let me also uh, ask you today what what do we know about how the Chinese government targets activists around the world? Read reports about how they use Chinese technology to detect the activist the keywords like democracy within their phones and, and, and so on. And, and how worried should activists be from the being targeted by China? I am obviously targeted yeah. in a way. Um, yeah. <laughs> I my, but I am quite lucky that I'm not, I haven't been beaten up on the street yet, like finger crossed. Um, in general, we experience a lot of like online threats. Like I receive trolling comments, even dick pics, harassments in my Twitter inbox on a weekly basis. So this is like the entry level. And um, some of my fellow colleagues in Germany have been followed or someone would ring their doorbell and said, I have your package. Like really weird and scary scenarios. And I have been successfully followed in Hamburg as well. Uh, but then the COVID started and then it's locked down. So not much to follow. Uh, but in general, this is a true thing that is happening, even though we're living in Europe already. Um, for example, uh, two weeks ago, I was filming an interview in Berlin with uh, a, uh, another activist friend, and she wore a jacket that says, uh, has a slogan that says Hong Kong Dependence on it. And she was, we were filming in an Asia market, and she got politely asked to leave the place, and we cannot continue to film because of her jacket that says Hong Kong Dependence. I was actually quite shocked to see it happening in Germany because I believe that we have the privileges to speak whatever we saw fit, we see fit in Germany, and we enjoy the protection of the constitution of German and the European Union. But that still happened, and it kind of made me realize that there are obviously ways for the Chinese Communist Party to export this sense of their own political correctness into other places of the world. And especially through institutions like the Confucius institutions around the world, they, through providing research funding, they're basically asked, they, they will require scholars and researchers to not speak as critically as they would about China because they're receiving fundings that are related to Chinese institutions. And this worried me a lot because I, I had that false sense of security that I'm in Europe, I have the freedom to do all my own research, to say whatever I see fit, but this freedoms that we once took granted for would be in danger. We're not cautious enough or we're not vigilant enough for the threats that are there. And I really feel like I shouldn't take it for granted. And that's why I, I keep saying that, oh, there are a lot of small actions that everybody could do. Like we, we retweet news, like talk about these threats that they see or talk about, uh, talk to friends on the dinner table, no matter how inappropriate it is about politics and so on and remind everybody on a daily basis that these things are happening and we're not that safe as we thought we would be. Mm. Mm. Uh, Guri, a question from, from the internet here. The Norwegian government has an opportunity to hold the Hong Kong authorities accountable for dismantling one country, two systems by revoking the EFTA free trade agreement with uh, Hong Kong. The FTA is wholly based on the existence of one country, two system which we agree is gone. Why has the Norwegian government not taken any steps in this direction? Isn't the lack of action also an example of self-censorship in Norway? Hmm, I'm not sure I'm able to answer that question. Mm -hmm. um, well, um, so I think maybe uh, I will have to take a pass on that. But sure. um, I think uh, at least- More I generally speaking about yeah. the free trade agreements yeah. also with- I think that uh, what has happened in Hong Kong in the last couple of years and also what we have seen uh, in other countries like in Australia uh, which um, uh, made a free trade agreement with China some years ago uh, and the consequences uh, in the last years uh, when Australia has been out and openly criticized China and China has boycotted the, the agreement um, I think that shows us that at this moment in time, China is not a reliable partner for that kind of agreement. So I don't think that Norway should uh, should um, go into a free trade agreement with China at this time. Um, when you um, make agreements like that, you're uh, sort of dependent on being able to rely on the other part. And I think China has shown many times that they're not uh, possible to rely on, that they 
uh, do not uphold their part of agreements, uh, and that means that it would be wrong for Norway to, uh, to make that kind of agreement at this time. Glacier, what do you see as the role of the United States uh, here? Many people are talking about the new Cold War. Uh, I'm not sure if, we, if, if, if that would be a, a, a good thing or not, but I'm interested in hearing your thoughts about the US role here. I'd say whether we like the narrative of Cold War, given, especially in Germany, given the unique historical background, I'd say we're in some sort of like really tense situation between the US and China. Mm -hmm. Anyways, um, if it's not about human rights, then it's about economic power, especially when it comes to the competition um, ranging from semiconductors. That is the core ingredient for every advanced technology that we're, even for electric cars that we are having right now. And I hate to, I, I feel like under a lot of circumstances, a lot of Western countries will have to take a side more or less, like whether they like it or not. I, I know that the European Union hate to have to be enforced <laughs> into taking sides. They're like, no, we're going to be this rule-based pay player in the world. But other than economic, like um, the dimension of economy that I mentioned, like semiconductors and trade and so on, the European Union has actually made take a side early on since its found, founding because it said it will uphold human rights as one of its core principles then when you're dealing with authoritarian regimes like China, it's impossible that you don't take a side unless you abandon your founding treaties, which I don't think European Union would ever go down that road because human rights is, and democracy is such a huge thing in Europe. And the role of the United States, I'd say they kind of lose the confidence and faith of other Western countries during Trump hmm. because of um, his own character and his own way of handling different things. But as a Hong Kong activist, I do see the perks of his China policy of being very upfront, saying that, no, this is not allowed for the wrong reasons, but at least he's upfront with China. Uh, and I hope that with Biden administration, there will be more cooperation through uh, between the European Union and the US. I know that Biden has been showing, um, like extending a hand to European Union, inviting them abroad. But recently there are some sort of argument because of ACUS again. Um, like there are all sorts of these on and off situation, but the role of the US as one of the biggest democracy in the world is still quite prominent in that sense. Um, but I heard a lot of people are saying, no, the US is gone after the election and after Capitol Hill, it's not going to happen as the way it was in the Soviet times. I do agree with that, but I don't think the influence of the US as the world's biggest uh, democracy and one of the biggest economic power would fade it that quickly. So it's a matter of racing against time. Do the Western world know that we are, have, we are having a ticking clock and that we need to act faster against that? Mm. Well uh, what's your view, uh, Guri, to see the uh, US rallying the rest of the world against China in the new Cold War, and would that be a good thing? No, I don't think so. <laughs> Even though I'm a bit too young to remember the Cold War, I think that's the least we want. Um, but I think, well, uh, the one thing that they have been able to agree on in American politics the last 10, 15 years is the attitude towards China. So even though uh, Trump and Biden act in a very different way and have different reasons for doing what they do. There's actually been um, a broad consensus also in the Senate and in Congress uh, on uh, what American policies towards China should be. Um, and I think maybe in that uh, time and place that we are now, um, I think maybe it has been positive that there has been one voice that has been sort of loud and clear against China. Uh, but I think in the long run, uh, even though it sounds boring, dialogue is a better way than confrontation. <laughs> uh, at least you have to be very selective on what kind of topics you choose for confrontation. And when you talk about the US, it has been more about uh, economy than about human rights. Uh, but if we uh, are tougher on human rights and maybe more dialogue about economics, maybe we're getting somewhere. Mm. Oh, I want to add sure. on that. I well. want to follow up on this. A complete Cold War as we understand it back in like the 90s, is, uh, 80s is not going to happen because of 
globalization and interdependence. Mm. So I, I think you're right about there are some topics that we should confront them, China in general, and there are topics that we require more dialogue. For example, when it comes to economic or fair trade treaties mm. and so on, it's always possible to add human rights clauses mm. into the trade treaties as the European Union has done with many other countries in the world, mm. like Vietnam and so on. So it would be a way to go that we kind of bundle these issues mm. together, as China always do. If you want economics, you have to shut up about human mm. rights. Then basically the West can do the same. Like yeah. We're bundling all together. We're not separated ever again. I think mm. this will work. Mm. Mm. I think we're moving uh, towards the end. So Guri Glacier, I think you'll have a couple of minutes just to end. I mean, Guri, China is going to be there for a long time. Mm. Uh, obviously, sometimes change happen very fast. Mm. Uh, what do you think? What's the future here? Um, <coughs> well, um, every sign uh, goes in the direction that uh, Xi Jinping is doing everything he can to consolidate his power, both uh, in China but also in the world. Uh, and I think, as I said in my opening uh, uh, statement, that uh, um, my fear now is that what has happened in Hong Kong now uh, can happen in Taiwan, uh, and that we also have to be um, very aware of what is happening in uh, other places in the same re region uh, in Asia. Um, <coughs> because um, uh, well right now, um, it seems that Beijing has succeeded when it comes to Hong Kong. And uh, then uh, why should they stop there? Why shouldn't they go forward doing the same thing other places? Um, so that means that Norway and other countries in the Western world um, uh, has to find better ways uh, of um, confronting China, uh, cooperating together uh, in order to um, uh, make some impact. And we have mentioned a couple of things during this uh, dialogue that Norway can and should do, um, that we can, uh, together with other countries, be a safe harbor for activists. Uh, that we shouldn't go into a free treaty agreement uh, at this time, uh, that we should cooperate more with other European countries. Um, so I think that will be uh, an important issue in Norwegian politics also in the years to come. Mm. Uh, Glacier, uh, talking about uh, freedom of speech here, if you have a, an, 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 an advice or something you urge everyone to use their voice to combat China, how, how can we do it? How can, can, how can everybody be a freedom of speech activist against China? I'd say with the invention of social media, be it being criticized as an opponent of democracy recently, I still see it's quite empowering for me as an activist to see people rooting for us. Like even it's just mm -hmm. retweeting news when things happen in Hong Kong, using the hashtag stand with Hong Kong, that always makes me feel supported in a way. And the th and it's always very important that you think th your think through your decisions, no matter how small it is. For example, when you are having an election and standing in the the booth, think about how the candidates, the politicians, deal with authoritarian regimes in the world. Because as you said, they're not going to stop at just one place. If they if they get a lot, like if they get a pass on something that they do, they'll continue doing it. So think about how do they deal with these authoritarian regimes in the world, be it China or Russia or at their place or at their regimes. And make sure that if you see something concerning, there is always a way to voice out that concern. You don't might not be posting it on social media, but sending an email, writing to your local representatives, expressing your concerns would make your representative feeling mm. people do care about this issue. So mm. I should care about that too. And this is how small actions on a daily basis would create and generate meaningful changes in the world. And I know that it feels quite far away, like Hong Kong, Taiwan, or Tibet, or Eastern, East Turkestan feels far, far away. But the threat of freedom can come to your doorstep very quickly. And in my experience, it can, like freedoms can be taken away from you very easily as well. So I would urge everyone to not take their freedoms for granted, always be very conscious about the decision you make, what you choose to say, what you choose to do on a daily basis. And this is where meaningful changes usually come from. It comes not only from like 
outspoken activists, but it comes from every small actions that we take as ordinary people every day. Mm. And one final question from, from uh, uh, the internet audience. And uh, this question is about how do you think Beijing will react or do you think Beijing will react any differently to cri critic toward Hong Kong when they have been able to ignore all critic when it comes to t t Tibet, East Tur Turkestan, or other human rights abuses in China over the years? Or is, is there a consistency in the, in the Chinese reaction here? I don't think they managed to actually ignore all critics. Like, Im like looking at what happened after the Xinjiang and Tibet, uh, Xinjiang re-education camps news broke out, the world were in shock that there was such mass scale of systematic oppression of ethnic minorities in China. And China had did a lot of propaganda, invested a lot of money in their campaigns to counter that narrative and said nothing is happening. Every Uyghurs in th those re-education camps are, are happy and like, living the best lives. And they were, they were furious after Canada and the US declared that those actions were basically genocide. Um, so I don't think they managed to ignore it, and I don't think they will manage to ignore the critics um, when it comes to their actions towards Hong Kong as well, because they never were able to do that since 2019 or even earlier before. Um, of course, if you if the situation in Hong Kong is still worsening, but that is not like the reference point of how critics work, I'd say. Mm. Um, in my understanding as an activist, this is a normal reaction from the Beijing government being so insecure that they would crack down on us as hard as possible because we are a threat in their eyes. And um, a lot of my colleagues would say, this is a necessary path that we have to go through, just like Taiwan has to went through the martial law period for so long until they achieve democracy. So we are being, maybe you would consider us naive, but we're still not hopeful but confident that one day things will change. It's not soon, not now, but eventually we will be able to have democracy and freedom in Hong Kong. Mm. Before we end, let me give a few short phrases in the region on our plans to the follow-up of this project on freedom of speech, Utrengsfrihet. Dette var første møte i Utrengsfrihetsforum. Som vi hørte så er det litt større utfordringer andre plasser enn i Norge, men det er fremdeles en del utfordringer i Norge. Så må jeg også si tusen takk til Oslo Freedom Forum som lot oss bruke deres uh, plattform for dette møte. Humanetisk forbund, Agenda, Lim og Civita vil frem mot sommeren <coughs> invitere til nye møter med utgangspunkt i Utrengsfrihet. Vi har jämliga uppdateringar i Facebookgruppen Utrikesfrihet, och vi också vill annonsera framtida möten. Och planen nu som pandemin lätte, så vi hoppas i alla fall det, och Norge öppnar upp igen, är att ha fysiska möten på kvällen, där folk kan mötas, lytte och gärna fortsätta diskussionen efterpå. Vi kommer att bruka lokala centralt i Oslo, och för de som inte har möjlighet att vara i Oslo så vill det självklart vara livestream och publicering av podcaster. Följ med på #utrikesfrihetsforum på sociala medier. Glacier Guri Thank you for your contribution to all our followers, to all our viewers. Thank you for watching and have a great week.